Thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. After Jesus fed the 5,000, and just before he talked about him being the bread of life in John chapter 6, he walked on the water. And this one is so memorable, I think mainly for two reasons. First of all, he walked on water. But secondly, the response of Peter. And I, it's really hard to decide which one is more memorable. We're going to kind of go along the lines of what Peter did this morning. Because I think while the other one is incredibly striking, the most practical part of it is the response of Peter. So before we go any further, let's go to Matthew chapter 14. Let's start in 22. We'll read through the, the episode of the life of Jesus. And that way it will kind of be in your mind as we get started. So Matthew 14, let's start in verse 22. Immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He had sent the multitudes away. He just fed 5,000 of them. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. That's a lesson in and of itself. It, it, it truly is. Now when evening came, He was there alone, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it's you, command to me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he had saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and they worshipped Him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We know all too well. I mean, we just read it, but honestly, we know all too well the, the episode of the Lord Jesus Christ. And particularly, we know that 31st verse. Because you go back and you look at that 31st verse, and that's when, of course, Jesus had said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We want to excel we want to progress. I hope that's why we're here. Because then if it's not, I've kind of got to ask the question, then why are you here? So I make a strong presumption that everyone's here because you want to advance. You want to be better. But there are times when people start to sink. So what we're going to learn are three great lessons about water walkers and not the people who are going to miraculously walk on water but three great lessons from the episode that I think are going to help you grow that I think are going to help you to excel in Jesus Christ and and the first one that I think that that we learn in the first one I think we kind of need to camp on just for a few moments is just simply the fact that water walkers get out of the boat and we do, it's easy to criticize Peter's life. There's, there's a lot to criticize in Peter's life. There's even a lot to criticize here. You've got Peter, he asked for permission to come out of the boat. We'll talk about that in a minute. And he did, and he's actually doing it. He's doing it. But then he gets afraid and he starts to sink. And we're, we're critical of that. We're critical of that, and I've told you guys over and over again that every one of us can look at every, every other person's life and just pick it to pieces. We have that capability, it is within us. But he got out of the boat. He got out of the boat. And we don't need to forget that. One of the beautiful memes that's kind of been going around on social media, the fact that you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Do you know how many phobias there are? I mean, legitimate, diagnosed, actually 
known of phobias that are in the, the DSM, which essentially is just a, a large medical manual that talks about every single malady in, in emotional health that people have. There's hundreds of them. And they can manifest themselves in a physical way. I mean, you can physically be afraid of flying. You can be afraid of large open spaces. You can be afraid of tiny spaces. They can manifest themselves socially. You can be afraid of big crowds. You can be afraid of being alone or being by yourself. There's all kinds of phobias everywhere. But we come down to the, I think, just the simple basic point, And that is... For a lot of people, the, the place of safety is in the boat. It's in the boat. And so people want to stay in the boat. Because getting out of the boat is scary. It's something to be fearful of. And that's a mindset. And honestly, that mindset is something that for all of us who are saints of God's people, we've got to work on that. Let's look in Romans chapter 8 and let's start to kind of construct a little bit how, you know, what do you do? How do you have a different frame of mind? Acts chapter, or Romans chapter 8, and let's start in verse 14. Romans chapter 8, looking in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that will also be glorified together. That gives me hope that can take away fear. And certainly in Romans chapter 8, and verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed within us. So I know that. You know, my being led by the Spirit, and as I'm giving myself to spiritual things, as I am abiding in the Word of God, I'm being led by that Spirit. That's the way the Spirit leads us. And the more that I do that, the more that I can have that fear taken away. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 1 in 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you'll turn there, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy was told something that was very, very, I think, I guess you could say inspirational. There's not a lot of time in between First and 2 Timothy in their writings, how much precisely there is. Of course, we don't know, but there's not a lot. We know from 1 Timothy that Paul had a desire for Timothy to be in Ephesus. He was going to have to deal with a lot of issues. Ephesians is a wonderful book. I'm actually thinking that we might study a little bit about the church from Ephesians next Lord's Day. But the Ephesians had their own problems. Revelation chapter 2 teaches us this. So Timothy had to go to this place that wasn't going to be perfect. It was going to be tough. And Paul wrote to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, again, I think something very inspirational. He told him, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound rational mind. A sound mind that can stay within the, the leadings of the Spirit, the revelation of His will. And a love for God to want to do that. So what does that give me? It gives me power. What does power do? It drives away fear. One of the passages that sometimes is a little bit mysterious, but I don't think it should be. 1 John chapter 4, when we look in 17 and 18. 1 John chapter 4, 17 and 18. And this is going along the lines of John talking about love, John talking about God being love, about us abiding in love. We abide in love because we're abiding in His will. So he says in 17... Love has been perfected among us. Love has, has matured among us. It's, it's been brought to completion. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, that mature love, casts out fear because fear involves torment. 
But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We'll, I'll develop this just a little bit more, but the idea of fear here is not the normal idea of reverence because fear like you know, a few words in the New Testament has, we're seeing the same English word, it's spelled the same way, but behind it, the original language, there are different words to it and they have different meanings. Most of the time, you've probably either heard me or Jim or other preachers. If you're visiting, well, you've heard people say that fear essentially means respect. Most of the time, it does. But sometimes, it's, it's literally the word phobos from which we get phobia. And so here, the idea is not a respect. It's actually fear. And I think in the context, he's talking about the fear of judgment. That's what he was talking about in the previous verse. So people have a fear of judgment. The fact is, if I love God, I'm going to do what He wants me to do. And because I understand that He has grace and mercy to everyone, then that mature love helps me to move out of that fear. As I move out of that fear, what can I do? Figuratively speaking, I can walk on water. I don't have to be fearful of everything that the world throws at me. And it's going to. I mean, it's, it's going to. Jesus even alluded to that in John chapter 15. I mean, look at this. In John chapter 15, this has the ability to scare people. John chapter 15, you look in verse 18. If the world hates you, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the, the world hates you. The Lord had said, this is, this is fairly late in the life of Jesus, not, not long before He's going to go to the cross. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, which is more kind of in the middle of His, his whole personal work, His whole personal ministry, you know, Jesus talked about the fact that if you're not with Me, you're against Me. So in order to serve Him, I've got to be able to stand against the world. And that's a really fearful thing. But what helps cast out that perfect love? What helps cast out that fear? It's that perfected love. It's, it's the attitude, the old idea of the can-do attitude. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if you'll let me just take a moment to go back to the Old Testament before we leave this point, you've got a really good illustration of this. In Daniel chapter 3, I mean, look at what these three young people were able to do. Daniel chapter 3. And we look in verse 16. Daniel chapter 3, just considering just for a second what three young people can do. And let's, let's face it, we, I, I want to say that we live in a time, I doubt that times change very much from generation to generation. Nevertheless, we live in this time, so I'll talk about this time. This time, let's face it, there's not a lot of confidence in young people. There isn't. And, and it doesn't take a lot of effort on your part to go looking for it online to find out exactly what I'm talking about. There's just not a lot of confidence in young people. Do we live in this particular time where young people have just taken this incredible downturn? No, it's probably this way all of the time. I don't share that point of view. I think people rise to the occasion. I think they always have. I think they always will. And you've got three young people in Daniel chapter 3, and you look in verse 16 when they were told, you know, you've got to bow down. You've got to bow down or you're going to die. Here were people who could be fearful. Here were people who had to get out of the boat, so to speak. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Meaning that, We'll give you the answer, but we really don't have to answer. Can you, do you feel it? Well, you know, look, you bow down. We don't have to answer. Can you feel what our answer is? Can you, can you tell what the answer is? 
We don't have to answer you. Nevertheless, in verse 17, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and He'll deliver us from your hand. I think, that's, I think that's amazing just real fast because it's easier for me to believe that God could raise someone from the dead. Why? Because we go back through history and there's several people that God's raised from the dead. At this point in time, unless you guys can show me something different that I've just forgotten about, I don't think they've got a lot of information where people had been pulled out of fiery furnaces. You know, they can't declare to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, go ahead and do it. He's going to pull us out of this fiery furnace. And you know why? Because he did my friends that way last year. There's not that body of information for them to go back to. So what did they have? They could have had unbelievable fear. I mean, wouldn't have you? Could you understand that? But yet, what did they say in verse 18? But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set out. We're just not going to do it. These were people who, again, figuratively speaking, they got out of the boat. And that is a, a tremendous, tremendous lesson. But it's not the only one. Water walkers have to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And that's difficult. That's difficult because we are so incredibly distracted. Maybe I could go out on a limb and say that at least over the last several decades, the level of distraction that we have has only increased. Are we the most distracted that we've ever been? I can't really say that. I can say that at least in my time as an adult, I can see lots more distractions now at this moment in time than there were 30, 35 years ago when I was just reaching and entering into adulthood. The distractions of business, the, the, distra the distraction of every kind of care of the world. I mean, all of the difficulties that we have to deal with. Again, it could be what we do in our careers. It could be managing our health. Those distractions are real. It could be the distractions of, of family. Just the distractions of not only trying to have a healthy relationship with a spouse, which is not easy in our day and time, but to then be able to raise children who are going to be good children with all of the distractions that they have to deal with, that's not easy. To have to think about all of the distractions with just the household thing that come along. What am I going to get involved in? How much am I going to get involved in? You think about Mary and Martha when Jesus came to their house. It, it seemed like the most innocent thing in the world, but one of them clearly made the right decision. We're not even talking about things that were bad. And yet they had a decision to make. So we've got decisions that we have to make. So what helps that? Well, it's the frame of mind. Colossians chapter 3, again... Everything pretty much boils down to, in the beginning, can I get my mind right? Can I get the, frame, the framework in my mind correct? So Colossians chapter 3, and you talk about verse 1. If you were raised with Christ, we'll seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. That means that you're going to know what to put first. There are distractions, but there are distractions that you're able to deal with and you're able to decide, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do this because I understand that I've put the first things first. In verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. All of the distractions that I brought up, and that was a terribly incomplete list. They're all of the earth. I mean, they're not necessarily bad, but they're all of the earth. He said, for, your, for you died, we're dead to this, this old life, you died and your life is hidden or it's stored, it's kept with Christ in God. It's, it's in a, if you think about stored, it's, it's in a new place. And what I mean by the fact that it's in a new place is that it's, it's now got this whole new, complete, different point of view. 
where I look to the things above, not to the things that are below. And that's the exact same way that we have to be. Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 22. Let me give you just this assurance. Matthew chapter 10, and looking in verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, looking in verse 22. The Lord is going to send out His disciples, and He told them, you will be hated by all for My name's sake. Just what we, He had said in John chapter John chapter 17 that we had read, you're going to be hated by the world, but he says, he who endures to the end will be saved. And what does it take to, to endure to the end? Well, it takes getting out of the boat. But it also takes what we're looking at now. It takes looking at life in a whole different way. Knowing that, I've got to look toward the things that are up in heaven. There's actually a nice way to illustrate this. Sir Henry Shackelford, who was a British explorer who went to the South Pole the beginning of the 1900s, he, he one time advertised for, for people, because you know back then, technology, there wasn't as much technology, and when there's not as much technology, the only way to replace that is with warm bodies. So to go on a South Pole expedition that was going to last six months to a year, you needed a lot of people. Here, here's the way it was advertised. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. He's not going to get a job at an advertising agent. However, the response was so overwhelming that Shackelford himself said, it seemed as though the men in Great Britain were determined to accompany us. All of the men in Great Britain were determined to accompany us. And why? Well, it's because they were doing something that they understood was valuable. It was heroic. It was going to move the needle as far as mankind was concerned. They were going to go look at a place that no one had ever looked at before. People can do absolutely amazing things when they understand the value of what they're doing. So over and over again, we're assembling. And the, one of the reasons why we're assembling is, is definitely to worship and to exalt God. But one of the reasons why we're constantly assembling is so that you can be reminded, and that's my job, I know. You're being reminded of the value of what you're doing. And when people know the value of what they're doing, they're going to rise to that. And I think in this episode in the life of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what we're learning. It's a great thing. We have people over and over in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, but based off of Hebrews chapter 11, and I'd mentioned this before in a lesson a, a few weeks ago. I, I don't know when it was. I can't even remember the name of it right now, but I did it. I know I did it. And when I mention it, you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember that. You just take these little nuggets, and the little nuggets hopefully are enough to change your life. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a long list. How long is it? There were 16 different people who were mentioned. And then, of course, brought up with others that, that couldn't be enumerated like the prophets. 16 different individuals that are mentioned. And in Hebrews chapter 12... Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those 16 people and then kind of the 17th one in the list were all of the prophets, again, just probably hundreds of prophets who lived under the Old Testament times. We're encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, which to the point in the book, the sin which easily ensnared them, was just unbelief. They, they weren't getting, they weren't seeing the value in Jesus Christ. So let's lay that aside and let's run with endurance, endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross and despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the magnificent part is that if we can be like the great cloud of witnesses, you look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, and Peter is concluding his letter, I mean just his last final thoughts. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, he kind of issues a, a blessing, I guess you could say. May the God of all grace, who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. So you, you run with endurance. And you can be just like Jesus who sat down at the right hand of God, a place of glorification. So now, who called us to His eternal glory. We can go to glory. God has called us to glory. After you have suffered a while, you know you're going, there's going to be times you're going to have to get out of the boat. You've suffered a while. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Make you people who can walk on water. Again, figuratively speaking. A third lesson. Again, I, I think it's a, a wonderful lesson. It's a great lesson. Water walkers love, believe, and obey His words. Go back to Matthew chapter 14 because this is, I felt like this was significant and, and maybe I'd never quite caught on to this before. But Matthew chapter 14, when you're looking down in verse in verse 28, in verse 28, look at this. Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. We kind of you know, think about Peter's impetuousness and maybe sometimes you might be tempted to think that when Peter saw Jesus, boy, he was just flat out the boat and he was going to run on the water to Jesus. But notice that wasn't the case. He said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And I think about the end of Revelation. You know, Revelation 22 and verse 17, it talks about the Spirit and the Bride say, come. There, there is an invitation for us to come. So what do we have to do? Well, you can see, we've got to love Jesus, we've got to believe Jesus, we've got to understand and obey His words. And His words are in a Word, magnificent. John chapter 7, Jesus, uh, Jim's just written, some, written an article on it, doing a video on it. John chapter 7 was a, a chapter of controversy. Strong controversy in Jesus. Scribes and the Pharisees sent the officers to go get him. They didn't get him. They came back empty-handed, John chapter 7, verse 46. And they said, never a man spake like this. Never a man spake like this. It wasn't that, the, that Jesus, when He saw these people coming, He had to work a miracle that, that froze their arms to their side or that made them motionless or made it to where they could. They came back and they said, no, we went to get Him and no man ever spake like this. Well, we've never heard anything like this. And it began to turn their minds toward Jesus Christ. His words, we could keep on going. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, in the incident when he's speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words won't pass away. John chapter 6, verse 68. They, get, they give life. They are spirit. They are life. John chapter 12, verse 48 we're going to be judged by His Word. So everything that I do, I do by the words of Jesus. And that's a good thing to think about. Colossians chapter 3. When we look in Colossians chapter 3, so let's, let's bring up something, Colossians chapter 3. And putting in the context in verse 15, so Colossians 3, let's start in verse 15. Let the God of peace rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's not the only way, of course, that we teach and that we manifest the grace of God. This is just as Paul was 
pointing it out, and thankfully for all of us, we've got that instruction when we sing. But it's another avenue for letting the Word of Christ not only then dwell in me richly, but then giving me the chance to actually express it to other people. And I do that through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There are, there are people who would believe that the love of God is so all-encompassing that you don't have to worry about what's a commandment and what's not. So as long as I understand that I love the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my might, then I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm, I'm going to want to just do all of the things that are beautiful and wonderful and holy. But there are words that I have to follow. And I can't... One thing that's a benefit to me is just being reminded of the motivation. And the motivation is the love for God. So whatever you do today, whatever you think about it, maybe you're sitting there and you're not thinking about anything spiritually. You know, maybe that's just gone from you and maybe it'll never come back. I don't know. But if you're here today, you need to realize you're doing this because you have the love of God in your heart. And if you don't have it in your heart, then you better get it in your heart. Or else I don't really know why, I don't really know why people are here. But beyond everything else, you do it because you have the love of Jesus Christ in your heart. Now, when you have that, then we realize that there are things for us to do. Colossians chapter 2 in the 6th verse. Colossians 2 in the 6th verse. And that, th th this makes a really, really good point. Colossians chapter 2 in the 6th verse. Now look at this. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, now so walk in Him. Walk in Him. And that's what we try to do. We try to walk in Him. Why? Because we love Him. Because we know Him. Because we love the Father. Because we know what He's done for us. There is a response that we have. God doesn't make us do anything. There's a natural response. And that natural response can be absolutely life-changing. And this physical episode between Jesus and Peter proves it. You, you start looking, and, and I've left it up here on the screen in front of you. Water walkers end up teaching us three lessons. First of all, they're confident enough to get out of the boat. Secondly, they are focused. They're not distracted by a bunch of things. They're not distracted by bad, sinful things. They're not distracted from good, beneficial things. They know where their heart needs to be. And then third, water walkers are faithful. They're obedient. Confident, focused, obedient. That's what we need to be. Confident, focused, obedient. Great, great lessons from how you learn to walk on the water. Again, figuratively speaking. Now, the last part, the 33rd verse, the last episode of, of, that, of that account tells us the most significant of it all. The most significant of it all. And that's where after everything had transpired, all of the ones in the boat responded by saying, you are the Son of God. Because that's what's the most important. Is, is understanding what position that He holds. And having that really firmly in your heart. That He is the Son of God. And because He is the Son of God, He's Lord and Master. And because He's Master, He can tell me what I need to do. That's not out of a hateful, authoritarian way. It's out of a loving way. Just like we've likely all raised children in our lives and we've likely all told them what to do. Not in a mean, hateful, authoritarian way, but because we love them. 
And we want to see them do well. We want to see them excel. We want to see them get out of the boat. So you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you do something about it. And doing something about it leads us naturally into the end of our worship together, which is the singing of a song that you can come up and, and indicate to us that you're ready now to make the right kind of decision, the one that's going to get you serving the Lord. It's, it's going to get you out of the boat. So this morning when we sing a, a good song, I told you it was a good one, Richard picked it, we didn't even, we didn't even coordinate. But Richard picked number 321, Jesus I Come. Just like Peter asked, you know, Lord, just say the word. Tell me to come and I'm going to do it. And he did it. Don't ever forget that he did it. Got distracted and learned a lesson, but he did it. Maybe this time, this morning, is your time. We want you to come. We want you to talk to us. Either you talk to us now or you can talk to us later about your identification with Jesus Christ. Your giving yourself over to Him, your obedience to Him because you love Him and you believe in Him and you want to follow Him all the rest of your life. If this appeals to you, come up here. Let's stand and sing.